In today's study in the book of Isaiah, we'll learn about the ominous events of the last days of the tribulation, followed by God's deliverance, and then the magnificent reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus as we continue our five-year journey through God's entire Word. Now, as you grab your Bible and you find your place in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 16, we got just enough time to share a few letters from the Bible bus. First is an email from a World Prayer Team member named Yvonne. I hopped aboard the Bible bus in 2016 and joined the World Prayer Team in 2018. I haven't been the most diligent prayer companion this last year. My troubles have kept me, for the most part, from being consistent in carrying the burdens of others. Yet I have much to be thankful for. Despite the tyrannies of the urgent, our faithful God's work in molding me into the image of His Son continues. He's developed in me a compassion for the sufferings of my siblings throughout the world, especially in North Korea and the Middle East, where I cannot even imagine what every waking moment looks like, if they even get to sleep soundly at all. Praying with you has also wakened me to my own selfishness and myopic immaturity. So shameful. I want to be more diligent, so now I pray for all of us warriors, asking the Spirit who enables to urge us to be men and women of courage and conviction as we face each day with joy and hope, until the Lord brings us all home. Well, that's right, Yvonne. Persevere, and thanks for the encouraging letter. Next, we've got a note, and this one's from a listener of our Indonesian programs. My family and I have been blessed by this program. Even my husband, who is an unbeliever, regularly listens with us. I pray that by hearing God's word, my husband will believe in Jesus. And then there's this letter from a listener of our Polish broadcasts. The fact that you called me brother in your letter has melted my heart and given me a lot of joy. Many things have happened in my life, and I've made choices I'm not proud of. However, the Lord is using me to share the gospel here in jail. I'm grateful for that. Living behind these bars is hard. Your messages get me through the day and help me to look for joy even in the difficulty. Finally, we hear from a listener over in Nepal. I come from a lower caste of Hinduism. In 2013, I received Jesus as my personal Savior and began to listen to your programs. Each day I learned important spiritual things. I'm trying to implement prayer, meditation, and worship into my everyday life. I never go a day without listening to you. Your words from the Bible are daily nutrients which help me to keep healthy. Truly, this program is helpful and gives me peace that I can now understand God's Word. Well, what's your story? How's God using these studies of his word in your life? We'd certainly love to hear from you. You can email us at biblebus at ttb.org or send your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now let's pray as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that's bringing people all over the world to yourself. We pray for them now, as well as for us to understand and then apply your truth to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Our friends, we return back today to the 24th chapter of Isaiah, verse 16. If you have your Bible and will find the place there, we're going to begin in just a moment. I want to bring us up to date. We are in this section where we have seen the judgment of God. Then it all headed up in this final judgment that's coming upon this earth that the Lord Jesus Christ labeled the Great Tribulation Period. And both Dalich and Jennings feel that all of it is now summed up in this final judgment when there comes upon the whole world a judgment from God. The Lord Jesus Christ labeled it the Great Tribulation Period, said it would be worldwide. And so here in verses 1 and 12, the Great Tribulation is a worldwide judgment from God. We saw that. We are told here, as he began in verse 1, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, maketh it waste, turneth it upside down. It's almost in that condition today, but we certainly are not in the Great Tribulation period. 
Then the second thing that he mentioned, the tribulation saints are to be preserved through the great tribulation period. That began with verse 13 through 15, and that is where we got down to, by the way. And we're told that in that period, these folk are going to be able to sing a praise to God. Verse 14, they shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify ye the Lord in the fires. Now, in the time of testing, of tribulation, they'll be able to glorify the Lord, even the name of the Lord God of Israel, in the isles of the sea. So there's to be a remnant at that time that will be of Israel and then out to the very isles of the sea. That would include the whole earth, of course. Now we come to the third division here, and the great tribulation is a time of universal and unparalleled suffering. Verse 16, "...from the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness." And Dr. Jennings translates that, "...my misery." my misery. That's what it's going to be. Woe unto me! The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. One of the things that will characterize the great tribulation period is going to be deception. In fact, verse 17 says there are three dangers that will be upon the inhabitants of the earth in that day. Notice them, verse 17, "...fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth." Now, fear in that day. There's no freedom from fear here. By the way, it was quite interesting that the Atlantic truce, you remember that Mr. Churchill and Mr. Roosevelt drew up, they said that one of the things that they wanted to bring into the world was freedom from fear. Well, how about it today? You want to look about in the world, the mob is marching, dissatisfaction and fear everywhere. This will be multiplied. And in the great tribulation, freedom from fear will not be there, but great fear. Pit is the danger of death. And hanging over this world today, there is a, a little atom, and that little atom is frightful. Death. Death even to the population of the world. But God says he won't let that happen. The Lord Jesus said that except those days were shortened, no flesh would be able to survive, but he's going to shorten the days. Then the third thing is snare. That is, that's deception. You remember that the Lord Jesus began that great Olivet Discourse that fits right into the Great Tribulation period. He said, "...take heed that no man deceive you." It's the time when the world will be led to believe they're entering the millennium. You get that impression today, don't you, from some of the world leaders that they're going to bring in the millennium. Well, then they're going to bring in nothing but the great tribulation period. And that's what Antichrist will do, of course. But the world will think they're entering the millennium. They're entering the great tribulation period. Deception. Antichrist. The One of the things that characterize him is he's a deceiver. And after all, that's what his papa is, the devil. The devil is a deceiver. And how many people today are deceived? They're deceived about life. How many people today are even thinking of eternity? Just things of the here and now. And today we find even science, the great organization, now rejecting for the first time the creation account. They don't want it. That's a great day of deception. You can be deceived today by science. You can be deceived today by politicians. You can be deceived today by educators. You can be deceived today by the military. And you can be deceived today by all these protesters. And the only help today is to turn to Jesus Christ. He's been made unto us wisdom and the only hope. But in that day, they really are going to buy this. And I tell you, Antichrist privately will be able to look at a world and say, Sucker, that's what they're going to be. Oh, my friend, 
The devil has long since said that the human race are a bunch of suckers. And that's what we are, unless we turn to Christ. Now we have here, verse 18, "...shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit." Some think they'll get rid of fear, and the next thing it means death. They may walk out and say, oh, I'm not afraid. And then the next thing it drops, and that's it for them. May I say to you, then those that don't go down into the pit of death will be snared. It's a time when the book of Revelation says one-fourth of the population is taken out at one time in a great judgment. Another, a third of the population. You talk about the population explosion, the explosion is going to reduce the population in that day. Now we have, when we come here to verse 22, we see tribulation saints are going to be raised from the dead. This is a marvelous passage of Scripture. They'll be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in prison. And after many days shall they be visited. That is, they go down into death and then they're to be raised from the death. I believe that what you have here is the fact that the tribulation saints are part of the first resurrection. They're going to be raised from the dead. I'll not read Revelation 20, verse 4 and 6, but you ought to read that. Now, the fact of the matter is, this is going to end by the coming of the king. Verse 23 then the moon shall be confounded, the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. And even nature's going to respond to the king when he comes to rule. And he's the only one that can end this period known as the Great Tribulation period. Now, chapter 25, we have here the kingdom. After the Great Tribulation, the Lord Jesus comes, he ends it, and then he establishes the kingdom. And this chapter brings us into the kingdom age. That's what the Old Testament's all about, that there's coming the king, and there will be the kingdom of heaven upon this earth. Now, that's what John the Baptist meant when he began his ministry. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Lord Jesus took up that message. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, our Lord, when they rejected the king, you can't have a kingdom without a king. When they rejected the king, there's no kingdom. And then he could say privately, personally now, come unto me, all ye that labor in a heavy laden, I'll rest you. That's still his invitation today. It is a message to be sent out to individuals to exercise their free will. And my friend, you're making a decision, whether you know it or not. Whether you believe it or not, you either make a decision for him or reject him. And somebody says, you don't get me on that. I will not make a decision. I will not accept him, and I don't reject him. You don't? Listen to him. He that's not for me is against me. You have to. There's no such thing as neutral ground. Now, we come to this wonderful 25th chapter, and it's a song. And this song has three stanzas here. We have first five verses, praise to God for deliverance from all past enemies. You see, now they've entered the kingdom, no more enemies. Praise to God for provision of all present needs. Be wonderful to have someone here that will be able to meet the needs of mankind, verses 6 and 8. And then... Praise to God for anticipation of all future joys. That's verses 9 through 12. Now, will you listen to this? O Lord, Thou art my God, I will exalt Thee, I will praise Thy name, for Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. This is praise to God for deliverance now. They now are in a time of great, blessing. And this is a song of sheer delight and wonder and worship. And this comes from a heart overflowing, for the worshiper now has come into a new knowledge of who God is and what he's done. This is not the average song service that you have in a church on Wednesday night. Some of the saints sitting there wondering why in the world they came in the first place. 
May I say to you, this is those that are eager to worship God because of faithfulness and truth. Now, these are the attributes of deity, and they are foreign to humanity today. The Scripture says, "...put not your confidence in man." Put not your trust in man. Isaiah's already said it. And faithfulness is the fruit of the Spirit and not the work of the flesh. And truth is the very opposite of man. You remember David said, all men are liars. But David said, I said it in my haste. Dr. Carroll used to say, David said, I said in my haste, all men are liars. Dr. Carroll said, I've had a long time to think it over. I still agree with David. Now, will you notice... Verse 2, Thou hast made us of a city and a heap. You see, all of the past now is gone. There's deliverance from the enemies of the past that don't need now a wall around a city to protect them. And now the strong people will glorify thee. What a picture. This means, I think, worldwide conversion Verse 3, Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nation shall fear thee. Man will turn to God in that day in the kingdom. The greatest, I think, revival, that is, of turning to God, is in the future. Now the night of sin is past, the night of the great tribulation. The day of the Lord always begins with night, the evening and the morning, or the first day. Weeping will endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And that's what you have here, joy during this period, and what a period it is. And then we have here praise to God for His provision for present needs. Will you notice here? And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. Won't have to worry about putting on weight in that day. Reducing will not be a problem in that day. You can eat the fat things. Now, that has to do with physical provisions, certainly, but it also speaks of the wonderful spiritual feasts that they'll have. I think there are going to be Bible classes in the millennium. And very frankly, I don't know. Maybe the Lord let me teach one in that day. I'd like to. And then he speaks here of the Feast of Wines, on the lees. That has a spiritual significance. The unutterable joys that wait those that enter the kingdom. Remember the Lord Jesus said, Come ye blessed of my Father. What a picture that we have here. And I must drop down now and look at the anticipation of all future joys. That's verse 9. And it shall be said in that day. We're moving now into the kingdom. Lo, this is our God. We've waited for Him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. The world was deceived by Antichrist, but now the real Christ has come, the real Messiah, the real ruler of this earth. And my, I tell you, God and His salvation are going to be Very vital to man in that day. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And what a wonderful picture that we have here. And this is a strange one. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. Moab shall be trodden down under him. Even his straw is trodden down for the dunghill. Why is Moab introduced here? Well, I'll be very frank. It's very difficult to say. But when Moab is up, God is down. When God is up, Moab is down. And in the kingdom, Moab's going to be down. God's on top. That's the picture. For Moab, as you will recall, we mentioned the fact that it represents something. And Moab represents a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And then we're told, And the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall bring down, lay low, bring to the ground, even to the dust. All pride of man will be brought down. And this is the period when the meek are going to inherit the earth. They're not doing too well today. Now, in chapter 26, it continues to talk about the kingdom. We have, first of all, prospect. In that day shall this song be sung... 
in the land of Judah, verse 1. That's the prospect. They're going to have a song in that day. They don't have it today, friends. It would be very difficult to say that the present return is a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, we have introspection, and that is in verse 9. He says, "...there with my soul have I desired thee in the night." And that is something. I wonder how many of us recognize this and recognize this great need. Now, we saw it in the little Song of Solomon, the book of the Song of Solomon. And you remember there when the bride spoke of, "'Kiss me,' and that was the kiss of pardon and of peace." and a passion. And then the bride recognized she couldn't rise to the heights. And she says, draw me, and I'll run after thee. That's what you have here. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Do you have today a passion for God? Oh, I hear so much of this pseudo and this smattering of spirituality today. And it has to do with this piosity and quoting of pious platitudes. I get so tired of hearing them. Oh, I love the Lord, and I want to serve Him. My friend, when you lie on your bed at night, do you have a desire for God? You really want Him? Do you have a real passion? Are you able to say, draw me? I want to run after you. And in that day... They will be saying, I tell you, this will make the millennium any day in the week. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. I find in my life, and I make a confession, I find I'm running from him a great deal of the time. And I find I get way out ahead and maybe step out of his will and Then the tensions come, and then I'm frustrated. And then I say, oh, I've left him. I've gotten away from him. I'm not close to him. May I say to you that our soul might cry out for him today. I don't see much of that, friends. I don't mean to be critical, but I don't see much of it. And when I do detect it, what a blessing it is to my own heart. Now, retrospect, verses 16 through 20. One here, and this looks back on the past. The picture is a woman with child. Verse 17, like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pang, so have we been in thy sight, O God. They look back to the past. And that great tribulation was like travail. Verse 18, we've been with child. We've been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth. And today, my friend, the suffering that comes to you, that can be a birth pang that will bring forth something worthwhile, or it can be just wind. And I'm afraid a lot of us are suffering today for nothing because of the fact We are not seeing in it that all things work together for the glory of God. We're talking now about the millennium, but some of us could be actually living in the state of the millennium today. We'd only seek him early. We'll leave off there and begin chapter 27 next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. It's been said that we should be kind to everyone that we meet because everyone is struggling with something. From the letters that we receive it through the Bible, I know that many of you are suffering in many kinds of ways. Maybe it's a health problem or a family heartache or a loss. Well, the first thing that you need to know is that in this season of suffering, God is especially near to you. Psalm 34:18 says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. It may be difficult to see through the tears, but God is very near. At Through the Bible, we also lift you up to the Lord in prayer. In addition to Dr. McGee being a Bible teacher, he was also a pastor with a very large pastor's heart. He knew from experience the comfort found when turning to the Lord in our suffering. From that personal experience and his desire to help those who are hurting, Dr. McGee gave a message called, Why Do God's Children Suffer? 
That message, and many others, including The God of All Comfort, based on 2 Corinthians 1-3, are available to you as free booklet downloads when you visit ttb.org forward slash booklets. Of course, we know what promises and delivers the most comfort is God's Word itself, and that's why we're on this five-year journey together. To receive the most from each study, I suggest that you read the Bible text before we get together, and then again afterwards. To download our free reading schedule that's available in a handy bookmark format, visit ttb.org forward slash bookmark, or to receive the bookmark by mail, sign up for our mailing list online at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Tomorrow we'll continue to climb the peaks of Isaiah, so join us if you can and catch up in the broadcast archives on ttb.org. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and for all of us at Through the Bible, I'm praying that God richly blesses you today. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.